thrilled that you're here today. I'm here with my friend Jane, astrologer extraordinaire and flower essence extraordinaire um, and codependency and narcissism and all sorts of really great fun stuff. So I'm excited she came to hang out with me tonight. So glad to be here. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Oh, <laughs> relax. Totally. This is like no big deal. We'll, we'll see who drops by tonight. Okay, cool. So you don't have to worry too much about it, but it'll show up on the screen who's here. And so if you ever want to stop and say hi, feel free. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. So tonight we're talking about, um, narcissism and, uh, in particular, whether you can predict <laughs> either like a narcissistic attack or, um, whether somebody could possibly be a narcissist. Um, you can tell all sorts of wonderful things um, through uh, what Jane does. It's really, really cool. She spends all this time. I'm going to look at you. It's a lot easier. She spends a lot of time. You spend a lot of time, you know, really looking. You've been doing this for decades now. So what got you, what got you into astrology in the first place? The very first time that I became interested in astrology was when I was at a bar and a woman came up and was having conversation with a man that I was dating and myself. And she started telling me things about him and things about myself based on her astrological knowledge. So wait a second, isn't that kind of rude to have some random person? I mean, because if you're a psychic, mm -hmm. they tell you not to just randomly go to people and tell them the psychic impressions you got. I don't recall exactly how it came up, but it wasn't done in a way that was offensive at oh, all. Oh, okay. It was more so just it's not like, like she just said, and then some like spooky outfit. Whatever it was, it Did was welcome. Did you ever welcome. wear a spooky outfit? <laughs> um, I, I have worn um, freaky outfits. You've worn more, freaky outfits like, more than um, spooky ones? Yeah, I know in high school, my friend's dad called me Jane the Freak Mastella. Oh no, that's <laughs> But a good freak, a good freak. A good freak. Like being, being crazy. Being freak crazy in a good way. Edge. Yeah, like you're, you're proud of your crazy. Do you ever do you ever tell people their charts while you've got like some special sort of thing on? Not anymore. <laughs> no. You used to. You used to. No, I, I I wouldn't say I used to, but I would say that's certainly not what I would be doing now. I wouldn't be thinking it's cool to sh be shocking. <laughs> just like wear veils, and I mean, because that's really neat. It just wouldn't be me now. It just wouldn't mm -hmm. be you now? Okay, well, that's cool. That's good to hear. You take yourself very seriously. <laughs> so, okay, so this woman comes up to you not offensively in a bar. Mm -hmm. It sounds like a joke, doesn't it? Kind like of. Like the beginning of a joke. Mm -hmm. So she comes up to you at the, in a bar and starts telling you all these things about yourself. Were you angry or shocked or freaked out or what? I was intrigued. Oh. And I was jealous. Because oh, I, I wanted to be able to do what she had done. And I, jealous in a good way though, um, and I was motivated to learn more. So to me, it was, um, I guess I would say it's one of the most profound bar experiences of my life uh, because it got me on the path to um, astrology. So yeah. after that, I went and picked up a, a, my first astrology book and I started studying myself first, which is what is typically recommended. If you're really okay. going to look into someone's chart first, look at your own chart first. Mm -hmm. And what I loved was that I was able to read things in that book that I was not able to understand how to put words to, um, to understand myself or to explain myself to others. Okay. So as I was going through that first book, it, I was just giddy, just underlining things oh, like, sure. oh, now I can express this uh, because now I have words to be able to express it with. And then once I had started a little bit with my own chart, then it was interesting for me to look at people that I was dating chart and my family's chart. and. Mm -hmm. It just uh, took off from there where I was looking to get more books and uh, study more charts and I just never got tired of it um, and there's always so much to continue to learn so it's not something that um, is ever stale but that is how I, I came across it did you ever um, did you do you use the chart to kind of uh, confirm when you know somebody's a narcissist or maybe more toxic for you? Well, what I would say for, for people, one thing that I think is um, helpful to know is that oftentimes if you're a very empath empathic person, 
you may be attracting more of the narcissist. So it's also important just to know your own chart. Like you might not necessarily be a person who's attracting a lot of narcissists. Maybe you're not a highly empathetic person with a lot of, of factors in your chart that would create that. But if you know your own chart and you know that you have certain tendencies where you're a highly empathetic person um, having a others oriented uh, perspective, you would know that already that you um, are at risk okay. of attracting this. Um, okay. And you would also want to know your own chart of um, the seventh house of the horoscope, which deals with partnerships. So your seventh house of the horoscope is going to tell you um, what astrology sign is on the cusp of that. And that's gonna give you a flavor of what type of partners you'd be attracting. And also if there's any planets inside of that house, you would have an idea of more of the different type of flavors. So if you know your seventh house and you know that you have a house that may attract narcissists, you would more than likely be on guard and, and aware. Um, but you can, of course, just know narcissists just by not even knowing astrology, by knowing the certain narcissism. But, and then you can, if you do know astrology, take those things that you learned about narcissism, and then it just goes hand in hand with the different astrology signs. So I'm curious, and I'm sure everybody ends up curious too, as to what, so if they're looking at their chart, what sorts of things will tell them? You know, can you give like five or six mm -hmm. things that they should be looking for that tell them that they're um, more likely to attract narcissists? Neptune. <laughs> <laughs> Neptune and Pisces. Highly Neptunian, Piscean people are the ones who, in my opinion, are attracting more of the narcissist. The Neptune is the planet that rules that empathy, the one that is just um, very full of compassion, the one that tends to um, blend in with others, the one that just wants to have peace and, and so forth. So um, if you are a Pisces sun sign, and uh, that would be something where you would be considering, oh, I already know that I'm a Pisces, um, but it's not just people who have a Pisces sun sign. You may have, um, Pisces rules the 12th house of the horoscope, you might have a, a handful of planets in there making you a very Neptunian individual, and that would make you more likely to attract those type of people. So, so things which are more of the water signs, so, the softer, the Yeah, emotions. so we're thinking um, Pisces, a very emp empathetic person, someone who is um, in incredibly compassionate, maybe someone who in the past has struggled with being able to um, see things clearly, maybe having a history of being having some confusion or um, idealizing uh, people or situations in a way that later you find it, it somewhat hurtful um, to yourself because um, your rose-colored glasses have gotten um, um, opened wide up and all of a sudden you're seeing the reality for what it really is and so you're is that like the quintessential um, hippie woman um, you know, when when you imagine somebody who's very soft like that and open and loving and kind and I, I, I would say I would think that we would see some some hippies with the Pisces but you would all this is also where you would see the, the really soft um, the kind of intuitive people um, the people and and the people the artists the artists as well um, whether it's um, painting or poetry or um, some type of um, beautiful music these are the people who uh, spend a lot of time in perhaps meditation they may be that is they may be more the loners type where the not necessarily loners but a little bit more introverted and they may be the ones that when when um, they're they're out they maybe would do better in um, a one-on-one -on -one, uh, situation with someone having having well, a nice conversation. Well, it's weird because um, you know I know a lot of people who are narcissists who have that personality mm. type. So I mean, if you're if you're softer and gentler like that, do you have if, if you're more likely to be wounded by things, then do you think you can turn into you know you can start to adopt those qualities? Um. You know, and start victimizing people as well. I mean, there's a saying in the healing profession that is, the people who've been victimized tend to be the worst victimizers. Mm -hmm. And what I would think when I think of the codependent or the empathetic, empathetic person and the narcissist, I tend to think that they are both victims and that they've responded in different ways. 
where um, one has dealt with uh, what their victimization of trying to um, not cause any conflict by adapting themselves to the situation and to, to other people, whereas the narcissist tends to have been, um, it seems to me in my, in, when I envision it, it's, it's almost like possibly the one who really couldn't get broken in that same way. They were more stubborn. But the, but so they they were more perhaps difficult, unyielding, um, and that's how they dealt with it, and then that's how they became more uh, as adults. Um, but at the core, of course, both victims, if you're um, operating at that level. So it's kind of the same personality type, but different ways of dealing with it. Also think about that in an astrology, everyone has all these planets and mm -hmm. all these signs. So there's a flavor of everything and everyone. It's just to a certain degree um, that someone maybe has way more of this type of an energy, but this other person over here has some of that in some way. So when you do hear people say like, we're all connected, we're all similar in some ways, we really are and people do a disservice when they tend to maybe demonize certain signs like oh I don't like Scorpios or Capricorns are the worst because you're, you're literally speaking ill about yourself because you have that energy in your own chart and it's just um, so we all have all the same energies it's just which ones are stronger and which yes. ones are weaker yes. and how they play together yeah and and, and what um, areas of your life that they're influencing and how um, w how the planets are aspecting each other which ones are um, the more um, tight aspects or even aspecting each other at all so I mean I'm a Taurus and you've looked at my chart so why why would I have narcissists in my life do you think well um, I'm so glad you asked I from what I recall about your chart is uh, that you're um, a cancer ascendant and with your cancer ascendant on the first house then we have um, the Gemini energy in um, the um, in, in the 12th house and you have your moon in Gemini correct okay so I, I had mentioned the 12th house earlier as being the house that's related with Pisces so with the moon that would be even like your um, emotionality and, that, and the moon also very much is related to your childhood up until that um, age seven years old so you've got the um, the Pisces signature right there and the 12th house tends to deal with um, things that are um, like dealing with your subconscious. Mm -hmm. um, so that would also be how, how your um, emotionality and the ways that, that you would feel secure is, is tied in with, um, with your subconscious and that it, there would be like ways that you would be um, working perhaps to help understand your subconscious, probably because you would be having a situation that might bring forth that you need some type of a healing in a sense that the 12th house um, can deal deal with um, disappointments so it, it's kind of a but at the highest level it's spirituality it's spirituality <laughs> spirituality yeah. god bless <laughs> yes and um it's also um it's also like dealing with like um healing in um in, in different areas uh, of of that that would be related to spirituality when i think of the 12th house like when i first started learning astrology actually um the 12th house uh, i was very uh, sad when you, for, you start learning it and you get um scared like oh no I'm, i've got this thing i don't like and it, oh my goodness oh sure yeah so, everything that's negative so, you start yeah. you know, so this is what i remembered yeah, about the 12th like house you're, you're, you know in trouble the 12th house was secrets sorrows self-undoing Oh my god, that's terrible. <laughs> but I made fun of it and made a rhyme of it. Yeah, and, and I kinda, sure hope so. Yeah, um, <laughs> but, but thinking about like at, at its highest capacity, it's, um, work, it's dealing with um, compassion and, and going deep with um, the subconscious. So now, oddly enough, I found that people who are narcissists tend to also be some of the most um, sensitive, and intuitive and uh, can be some of the kindest people that I know too. Mm -hmm. How does that fit in? Um, well, I'm gonna tie that into um, the other thing to finish up your question about what else could be with yeah. the, the, oh, yeah, the narcissism with, within your chart is just by being um, the Taurus sun, 
Um, so there's the, the things that I've observed that may be related to um, the being on the receiving end of the narcissism is already what I said about Neptune 1 because you, um, you don't see things clearly and you see their potential and you have um, way more tolerance for people because you, you have such strong empathy so that you put up with more than uh, what a typical person would. That's Neptune. Whereas Venus is the ruler of Taurus, and your Taurus is your sun sign. And the sun sign, yes, is tied in with your identity, and it is how you shine, but it also can be related to the men that you would attract in your life. And then we've got the Taurus, which is ruled by Venus. And I feel like Venus is a big player in the codependency dynamic or, the, or um, getting into, because Venus in, in a sense, um, it's one of its main rulers is it deals with relationships. But Venus is also known as being um, the one who is in a way like taking care of others, um, thinking of others, um, and being um, social, wanting to keep things um, nice and smooth and um, just, um, in some ways, uh, avoiding conflict. Venus can be known um, for av avoiding some conflict at time, but um, I, I feel like there's a, a Venus element very much involved with it. And then on the flip side, with how can a narcissist have this? So the narcissist also can have the Venus, where they would be incredibly charming and sweet and um, nice to have uh, as um, a companion for a certain period of time. And they may also be very Neptunian, having a strong sensitivity and um, being having a certain kind of depth and uh, seeming uh, to be um, just just sweet. Um, so it, it's in both of them. But um, the one thing that would come up more with um, the narcissist is, which is an interesting one for me, is Uranus. Uh, so Uranus is the ruler of Aquarius. So when you have uh, Uranus, one of the things that is um, tied in with Uranus is entitlement. So oftentimes that's where you're going to see the narcissist. So it's almost like it's it's almost like you have a um, a mix, like a cookie recipe, and that if you've got certain qualities in certain houses, then you're more likely to be a narcissist or to be victimized by one. I I would think that your chart would tend to make um, it like that you would already have the predisposition to go one way or the other based on what type of, um, uh, I don't, I, perhaps I would say it's a strong word, but trauma, um, whatever trauma that you receive in childhood that does get you in these little categories of going one way or another. Um, but also um, the, the interesting thing, that I wanted to share about Venus is Venus is somewhat always close to the sun. Um, it's the closest of all, it usually is Mercury, but then it's followed by Venus. So oftentimes if you find someone who has um, Venus really, really close to the sun, um, that can be someone, the sun like rules themselves and then Venus is dealing with love. So you've got someone who Loves, who loves themselves, themselves a lot <laughs> and maybe to the detriment of, of others when they're in a relationship with them but uh, on the flip side I will say that in, on my chart I have um, a, a similar thing but it's tied in with the Sun and with Jupiter but then so then I would always say the interesting dynamic is to like look at yourself like what are you where are you um, secretly narcissistic that you're not really um, always proud to admit um, so as, as I um, have grown over time I can look back and, and remember times that like mm, it seemed like that was you know a pretty big ego thing going on there this was an ego thing um, so oftentimes um, it, it can be our own charts that are attracting these type of people because once again so then I'm gonna attract um, a man with Sun conjunct Jupiter that could even be just described as like um, a man with like like a big ego kind of thing. So, so. a lot of times I see narcissists um, in relationships with each other mm -hmm. you know and you know when you said about the Venus and the Sun and you know how you love yourself and I sat there thinking I love myself a lot and so I, I, I have the feeling you know from the past and my woundedness and the fact that I do love myself a lot and I do love life a lot, um, how I can be really selfish and self-absorbed because I'm so focused on my senses and on how I'm feeling, whether I'm feeling happy or sad or angry or 
my skin feels tingly or my stomach's upset, that it hijacks me and I'm not able to be as present to people because, because I'm, I'm really diving into my own experience. So that's a certain type, not everybody's like that? I think that's a, just um, somewhat unique to you. I honestly, um, I, I don't think um, <laughs> loving yourself a lot is <laughs> detrimental. Uh, I love myself a lot. <laughs> but was it always like that or was it after uh, working, working at it? Okay, so I'm gonna give, I'm, I'm gonna give a, a, a confession Yes, I've always thought that I was the coolest person around. Awesome. I, always, <laughs> I, always, I always found myself more interesting than I found other people. I always found life and experiencing life a lot more interesting. And um, so it really wasn't just from trauma. It was, it was very weird. I, I think the most uh, challenging thing for me was nobody thought I was as cool as I thought I was. And that was, that was really hard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I can see how that could be, you know, really not letting myself see that other people have other experiences that I don't have, you know, in engaging with life. I think that's one of the big lessons with astrology is it, it really lets you recognize that everybody's unique, you know, in how they live their life and how they interact with it. Absolutely. So why do you, what do you think causes two narcissists to come together? Well, I would think if, if two narcissists were, were coming together, it would be like that they are um, using each other equally to help each other feel more secure. I would think it would be more rare though, um, based on other studies that I've done, but I, I have heard other people say like, no, we've seen two narcissists together. So, um, so what would be the situation that would draw two narcissists together? I would think it would just be that they think that each, each one of them, um, that they can benefit from the other. Okay, so that, they can that, see. Yeah, yeah like, oh, would, you make they're... me look, I, you're attractive, you have money, um, you're going to look good in business, um, I can benefit from you. It so always it made me made... think of the 80s, you know, all those songs from, <laughs> like, the Eagles and whatnot of, uh, <laughs> how, you know, the, uh, people taking too much, you know, too many drugs and living that fast lane and the... <laughs> It makes me think of all those songs, living in the fast lane. Well, I guess it does remind me of something of the 80s. Yeah, like, so, like, it's a whole 80s feel. Mm -hmm. So maybe mm -hmm. the 80s was a very narcissistic sort of decade. I feel like the movies maybe were kind of. Maybe right? in the movies, yeah. but not reality. Mm -hmm. Self-indulgent, very self-indulgent. Well, you know, and sometimes people have narcissistic qualities, but they aren't considered a narcissist, mm -hmm. you know? And, um, and I think that happens a lot because uh, let's say you've got one person who's on, you know, less emotionally inclined, let's say an engineer, you know, is, and, and so they kind of behave in a narcissistic way just because of how they think. You know, they're always right, they're very linear thinkers, they don't have as much emotionality around things. And then on the opposite side, you'll end up with someone that's over emotional and so focused on, on the drama in their life and the experiences that are happening, that they're narcissistic in their way. And so um, I think I think we all, not we all, it's too generalized, but I, I, I've seen people pair up like that. You know, they're a little bit more extreme than what I'd be comfortable with, and they can't be termed, you know, narcissist as, as a diagnosis, mm -hmm. but because of just how they're wired, they're extremely narcissistic. Another thing when I think of narcissism and how it plays mm -hmm. out in the chart is I think of um, what areas would be related with selfishness. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that would be Aries, in my opinion. Okay. <laughs> so um, it, it, it's, to me, it can be like little recipes of, of all these um, different, different little things. And what um, is great about my experience when I started studying astrology was I remember um, literally having a situation where as I was reading it and underlining things, I saw something that said that I, uh, I had a tendency towards something that 
I had insisted to my boyfriend that I did not have this problem. Oh, so, really? Um, so you couldn't see yourself in it? Well, but at that, I, I joke and I say, like, you can't lie when it's right out there in front of you anymore. You can't lie to yourself. Or, right. or you, you felt justified for acting a certain way or whatever it was. Yeah. But um, that... Um, what was an interesting, humbling uh, moment that I that I always remember. But that, what's awesome about that is it um, made me better in that relationship in that one instance, <laughs> where um, then I could go back and be like, I I, well, I don't know if I admitted it to him or not, but I definitely um, took took it to heart. Yeah. Well, now I'm fascinated mm -hmm. to see if you know what the people in my life say about me if it's true, because you know my <laughs> ego gets in the way, and my ego says. You know, of course not. I'm right. This is the way it's going to be. And uh, you know, I've, I've I've got a friend of mine, and this friend they tend to be very truthful in a in a very loud, assertive sort of way. Mm -hmm. And so they, you know, cause a lot of emotional reactions in me. They they push a lot of buttons. But I learned a long time ago to separate the message from the messenger. You know, one of, the, one of the neat things I find about people who are behaving in a more <clears throat> narcissistic way is that they point out truths, truths that, you know, we might not want to admit. And when I put my reaction down in my past and my fears and things like that and look at, at the things that nobody else was willing to tell me, you know, but they're willing to say it in a way that will make an impact and I'm gonna listen. You know, it can really turn into a gift. I, I would agree. Um, one of the things that I feel like is a disadvantage in our society sometimes is that um, things are so um, politically correct and that we're so um, keen on not hurting someone. Um, and um, saying, uh, and if we are going to say it, we're going to have to really fluff it up so so we don't hurt this person's feelings. But for certain things to maybe make an impact, maybe it does need to be said with a little bit of bluntness. Um, if it's done by some someone who you feel like is um, coming from it from a good perspective, like they're not your well, enemy. they're they're. <laughs> They can be my enemy, and, so, and, they're, moment, and, they're, and they're, they're typically coming from a place of they're hurting. When, when this happens, they're hurting, and they are looking to make me hurt as much as they hurt. And because of that, they will push the very things that I'm most insecure about, you know, that, that I deny the most. And they, and they will, you know, because they're looking for the target. And so they will, they will say things that once I calm down, you know, I'll be like, wow, that might be getting in my way. Mm -hmm. That might be a way that I'm sabotaging myself. And so even, even though they, they're, they're deeper, their deepest intention is good, even mm -hmm. though their immediate intention is to um, emotionally, you know, beat me up, let's say. I guess since so much of my interactions have been with these type of people, it doesn't even uh, it doesn't even phase you. But huh? so I would say that part of the time I I would be I, when I was in those situations, I would have either not been receptive to it and been been um, waiting for my next thing to say. But on the other hand, there was um, a, a handful of times where things stuck out where they said something that it it did really stick in there. So I guess it's. Um, you just in the ideal world, <laughs> it would just be, it would be a, a more fair fight, and yeah, not and not true. like um, a bunch of gaslighting or that you know yeah. you're never going to be heard because they can never be wrong. Yeah, but like that stuff is mm -hmm. is um, toxic. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it is. But I think less. I, I think fewer people are actually clinically narcissistic. In in my mm -hmm. happy go lucky, you know, cheerful little world, I think that that most people behave in a very narcissistic way but but they they aren't so um at their core they're they're not as emotionally detached i think it's a spectrum and i also think if you get in a relationship that feeds it it gets worse and worse and worse and that's when they start to be um uh 
on on the the far end of the spectrum where they maybe still might not get um, a, a diagnosis from from a professional but that you would look at them and be like um, you know if they're not they're right underneath it so um, so it's the dynamic that can push people to those edges too I, the, the I would think so I, itself. I, from what I understand about when you're in a relationship when, with a codependent person and, and a narcissistic person or a highly empathetic person and a highly selfish person um, it, the, it the, the selfishness just gets worse and um, the the person um, who's trying to accommodate just um, accommodates till till they're just um, uh, obliterated till they're, <laughs> yeah, till they're completely destroyed yeah so um, what are some of the qualities that uh, that make someone's narcissism or selfishness worse um, well I in in some respects I would say um, that it, that the sun sign which deals with your ego so it, if you um, are having um, your sun sign in a very self-oriented sign, like I had mentioned earlier, um, Aries is a self-oriented sign, but so is Leo. Leo's known um, of having the ego. So let's say if we have um, a lot of planets in that, um, the, those type of signs right there, particularly your sun sign, well, actually your sun sign is even, is considered to be quite well positioned in those so you would think that it, it would be very strong but let's say if we have um, a lot of nasty aspects of um, other planets that are weakening it or and making it um, stressed out so you might say like oh sun and aries sun and libra that's great and then you look at their chart and you think oh my goodness i'm uh, i feel really uh a lot of compassion for this person who has this chart so let's say that their sun sign is afflicted like Neptune the planet we spoke about earlier Neptune um, weakens things so let's say you have um, a stressful aspect from the Sun to the Neptune and then you've got someone who has um, has difficulty with their identity a confusion of their identity or they didn't have um, the type of um, masculine role models that would help promote a healthy identity um, for whatever reason um, so you you can have um, the afflictions of the planets and then you it can also be like where the um, planets are in the place of the horoscope so um, and even looking at the degrees it's just uh, endless but in general when um, when we're, we're thinking about it we're thinking about like someone that it's, it's a weaker chart in, in some way shape or form like let's say um, Mars the planet that deals with like male um, sexuality but also assertion so let's say if we see um, Mars and then it's retrograde in a man's chart <laughs> like so I what does retrograde really mean <laughs> I never understood that so um, retrograde means that the planet um, from our vantage point on Earth, appears to be moving backwards because it has um, gone gone slower, and it's. I've heard it described, and this is an interesting description that it's like um, when you're um, when you're passing someone on the highway, they appear to be going backwards, but it's just because you're going forward more quickly, and that that can explain what it looks like to us. But in general think about it this is that it's a retrograde it's a reverse of the energy so when we're doing retrograde um, things we're thinking that things are um, it's like reverso so if you've got the planet that deals with um, aggression um, and it's reversed in a male, male's chart and this and this is dealing with the males aggression Mars is very much tied in with men that is going to be um, it, it's not going to be typically a strong you're, we're going to be like looking at that and um, and also it's kind of like more even just um, musing like hmm I wonder if this person could be insecure and then usually as you get to know that person um, it's it just shows up right in front of you that's the, the great thing about studying someone's chart you don't have to know everything what you can do is you can look at it and say like I wonder I wonder and then as you get to know them, you can check the boxes as you go, as, as they show you who they are. So do you feel more comfortable now getting into relationships that you know astrology well enough that you can kind of gauge what you'll be getting into? Or are you more comfortable and confident well, risking that stuff? <laughs> I would say 
that I am more comfortable than if I didn't know astrology. But also what I know about my own chart is that I have a, a blind spot when it does come to partnerships. And also um, a lot of astrologers have um, experienced this as well is we can spin anything to make it work of okay. like, oh, this. Like all the research, yeah. Well, you no, can you, you can no find even, in your, own, even your right. own head that you yeah. just say like, oh, this isn't going to influence us that way because we're both really spiritual people. So we're not going to be doing this lower level okay. stuff. So what? So you're able to lie to yourself. Or not even idealize. You idealize oh, and you that's hope. That's much nicely. And much nicer. Um, so what I what I feel like is that um, that I could be much more likely to be able to um, not engage with like a clear red flag. Um, but I think also I do value other people's opinions who can give me insights. Uh, so I, I do have. Um, a couple people who I'll be reaching out to if I ever do choose to um, date someone because I, um, with my Neptune stuff in my chart, I, I don't like the idea of even um, getting a little bit attached, even just meeting someone after a, a little bit, whatever it is, and then find out that, that it might not be in my best interest to pursue. Um, so I, I like the idea of reaching out to other astrologers who can give me insights. And what I like about that too is even if not everything that they say ends up, uh, I mean, it's, it's just data that later I can, I, as what I know about an astrologer, being an astrologer, I can say like, oh, she said this, but I can see how it played out like this. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's, it's just things that you don't necessarily, um, might not be able to see that someone else can show you with, with their wisdom and experience but um i can say um i would i would i don't think i would be able to t i can't imagine i'm starting to stutter with 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 um like oh my goodness what if i couldn't someone didn't know their birthday like some random thing like they were adopted and they were like i don't know i was born i know i had a girlfriend from middle school she didn't know her birthday she was like born around this three week time in, okay. in uh, china cool. so um that would that would be um very stressful for me if i could not know someone's birthday okay. um and that that would um be uh, i horrible actually because <laughs> i would want to I, I that would be that's a really special thing for me um yeah. and so i i would um it would kind of be like that certain part shut off but then i would probably just have to then use and the, the intuition and that's um the other thing um when you study astrology oftentimes when you're meeting people with strong personalities um positive or negative you start to be able to know exactly what's going on so you're thinking like, oh, something's going on with their Mar with with Aries or Mars or the the their um the house that is um in with Mars or oh that's interesting. So it's oftentimes um, amusing to me when um, someone's like, oh, I'm not going to tell you your my birthday because you know, and I would um, if I for whatever reason had some good intuition for them based on their astrology. Can you then guess their birthday? I can sometimes guess their signs, quality. their signs, but um, the other thing is, is sometimes I don't like to do that because then um, maybe I'm guessing their moon sign or their ascendant mm -hmm. sign, which is mm -hmm. also still very strong in their chart, but then it will give them um, the experience of like, she was wrong, and oh, she, sure. or she's just yeah. saying that, oh yeah, it could be anywhere, but um, there, there have been times when, when I've guessed, and then it's, yeah. it's very um, affirming, of course, and yeah. you feel like, it yeah, feels fun you know and cool, yeah. or that that you knew that you were correct with your own intuition. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's not really foolproof knowing knowing either your chart or somebody else's chart, because it's it, it helps, but there's a lot of things that can muddy the waters. That's why I think it's very good to get um, other astrologers' insights and mm -hmm. um, yeah. not necessarily your astrologer who is. Like your your best friend who's just learning astrology. Sure. <laughs> like it's like right. someone who you right. know like they are better than you. Right. Better than you, you. You want you want someone better than you That's and true. significantly um, better where um, they, they're experienced. So 
I would, um, I would encourage everyone to get whoever they are partnered with looked at for their chart, not necessarily to say like, oh, I'm not going to be with them or, oh, we're not good for each other, but to find out uh, what your, the strengths that you both bring to their partnership and what your challenges are. So I would imagine if some people who um, have conflicts with communication, if you would actually just know that in your chart, it's written right there that you guys are having your conflicts and it's not necessarily anyone's fault because it's both of your guys that are um, hitting this way. Like to me, that's just healing in itself. Um, and then also to know, um, to have an astrologer be able to tell this person, I think for this person would benefit from you approaching it like this and this person would have would this. Um, because I think sometimes people think that they need to act a certain way because otherwise they're being disrespected. I know that's when I was in my 20s, I was like, mm -hmm. you, mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I'm gonna, yeah. not allowed to be uh, disrespected, but of course, uh, I, I'm not sure where I'm even going with this, but. Well, and then, uh, so you probably behaved in a very narcissistic way. Yes. Because you, know, you were so defensive yes, and, and yes. ready, to, ready to fight for your honor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So from all this chart reading, uh, about narcissists and people who are in narcissistic relationships. What are some of the um, either wisdom or, or insights that you've kind of developed mm -hmm. around it that might not be commonly known? I mean, mm -hmm. for example, I belong to a lot of narcissistic narcissist groups on Facebook, and I don't, I haven't really engaged much, but uh, so I get stuff in my feed all the time. But the thing that, that I see is most of the information around narcissism, at least the ones that show up in my feed, are very, um, very angry, you know, and they're very blaming. And, uh, you know, like many times I think narcissism is a mental illness you know, or, and narcissistic tendencies can be mental illnesses, you know, borderline personality, for example, when someone has a borderline personality, they don't, they don't want to be borderline personality, they don't want to behave in such a narcissistic way, but they feel like you did in your 20s, but they had no choice. And so here's this person behaving like the, you know, the biggest victimizer around, and, and they're doing it because they feel so helpless and out of control. So, I mean, that's like one of the insights I've gotten that I don't see that's being, you know, passed around. People aren't looking at narcissism as a mental health issue. They're looking at it as a, a victim victimizer. And so, I mean, so I have a tremendous amount of compassion actually for everybody who ends up involved. I would agree. And I know I've, when I've seen certain sites, I've, there, there's the, the small percentage of people that are that would be I would think more I, I don't even know what the word to use I would want to say enlightened or just more compassionate or they're just more evolved and they'll write things like these people these are people right, these, these are also people. these are also victims mm -hmm. and so um, it can be very easy when you're um, in the position which would be more likely to be portrayed as the victim to um, to uh, make that your identity and to get a lot of sympathy from it. It's, it's very easy because you can tell your story and people would be, oh, oh my gosh, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, so yeah, why almost every, everyone, everyone's gonna you. agree with you. You're, everyone thinks whoever you're with is awful and um, you, you feel um, uh, affirmed that, uh, that you have been uh, wrongly treated and that this is um, not your fault. Like that you, and that you've done everything that could have helped it and only things got ever got worse. Um, but this um, ties in um, twofold like uh, of something that I like about um, knowing your chart. Um, so I, I spoke a little bit of it earlier. You need to know your birth time to know this of what um, the of where the houses are placed and the, the ascendant is the first house in your chart which deals with your yourself and what you present and then the exact opposite is your partners and um, what is also known for our seventh house which is dealing with our partners is that we are going to um, oftentimes be projecting um, all the things that we don't like about ourselves onto our partners or even making it 
more real, we attract people <laughs> who we are, uh, the things that we don't like about ourselves or, or we haven't um, accepted yet. So an interesting exercise is when you um, have a certain situation with a person and you're like, I really don't like them. What don't I like about them? Could this be a projection issue? So you can write down all the, the things that you don't like about them. And then you can ask yourself, um, do I have any of these issues? And then one time when I, I did that, I, I'm, a, I'm a pretty um, hard on myself person anyway, so uh, like I would be a perfect person to do this exercise, but I had all those qualities at that time. I was like, yes, I don't like that about myself and I don't like that about myself. Um, so the interesting thing is, is kind of being uh, just aware of that dynamic of like, oh, um, so I can work on myself on those, all those things that I didn't like about them that I still have unfinished business with and then I will attract someone who will not have so much of those qualities. So that is taking more a, of um, a, um, you're, you're taking charge instead of being a victim. You're become, being more like um, of, of a creator. And um, when we're talking about the narcissism and the codependence and that we're vilifying the narcissist, one of the things like that, my favorite topics that was so profound to me was um, the drama triangle. And so in the drama triangle, anytime you're in the drama triangle, um, it's, um, it's horrible. Like, I, well, I'm being dramatic. <laughs> Maybe it's and not always love about horrible, you. but um, it feels horrible to anybody who's it's, in it. It's, yeah. I mean, it it's very unsatisfying. For everybody. It's unsatisfying. Everybody in the drama okay? triangle. Okay, so you're. Suffering. It's unsatisfying. And so here's the points in the drama triangle: is that we have um, the victim who says, "Like, poor me, I'm helpless, and I, I can't. Nothing can ever." But that's also a learned behavior. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of times there's a growth mindset and there's a fixed mindset and like 80% of the population believes in a fixed mindset. They don't actually recognize that that we evolve and grow as people. Whereas I've been on a Greg Braden kick lately. I, I, I sucked it up and I got the subscription for Gaia. Okay. <laughs> so uh, so uh, I had a chance for the last few days to do a, um, what is it? A, a, marathon viewing mm. of, of missing links with Greg Braden and one of the things that he talks about he had a little video clip of the brain and it showed how we um, we create new ideas and new connections and he said it takes three days and you could watch it it was like this pulsing along the you know one of the threads coming out from you know the neurons and it would pulse and go a little bit further and pulse and go a little bit further until it made a connection with a, with a new idea. Three days it takes, but it's that mindset that we can't, that there's nothing that can be done, that mm -hmm. we're helpless. They've done it with rats of, you know, they'll put glass in between the food and the rat and do it long enough and the rat just gives up and believes that there's no hope and no choice. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I had to come, I had to develop a lot of compassion for understanding the victim mindset, which is, when you're conditioned to believe that there is nothing you can do about your situation and that change is not possible and that you can't grow and it's impossible for you to grow, um, we adopt this, this attitude of, of helplessness. And that's part of that, the victimization mm -hmm. of the drama triangle. I've developed a lot of compassion around the victim mindset. And, and that's something that actually narcissists can, can imprint on their relationships too, right? They, one of the one of the drawbacks I've heard, especially for people who've, who've been deep in narcissistic relationships for like decades or even just short dramatic ones, is that the minimizing and the belittling convinces you that there's nothing you can do. Mm -hmm. You know that you are trapped and helpless, and and it keeps you stuck in that in that victim mindset, mm -hmm. not realizing that you can change the whole thing. And there's even that phrase that I've heard, or that um, learned helplessness, which mm -hmm. I, it, it goes yeah. hand in hand. I heard that um, was dog training too. I watched something with Caesar Milan, mm -hmm. and uh, they were talking about how uh, it's called learned submission. And I realized that as a kid, you know, because of the situations I was in, you know, that that when you're suppressed like that, it's it's a learned submission. 
and it just it's really devastating on the psyche to be in that in that place and to be that person mm -hmm. it makes sense to me that um over time of the feeling the same thing of the same thing more experiences would just create more of um, the mindset of um, I'm powerless and I can't do anything mm -hmm. um, because uh, with the drama triangle actually everyone is considered a victim there's three players okay. um, and like one of the main players is the victim but like everyone's a victim because it's just um, so unhealthy so you have the victim who is usually going to be um, the the person who is with the narcissist okay for mm -hmm. example mm -hmm. and then we have the narcissist who's usually going to be um, what they call the, the persecutor the one mm -hmm. who's your bully who's holding you down who's mm -hmm. keeping you from um, who's making you feel hopeless in mm -hmm. your in your opinion mm -hmm. and they're suffering too absolutely um, because this is the way that that they feel in control and the way and the usually the reason why they are the way that they are is because at one point in their life they were the victim and they were like this sucks um, I'm gonna be stronger and this is how how they felt that they become stronger and then the other one um, in in the drama triangle is usually found um, when people have gotten very much entrenched in the codependent narcissistic relationship and that's um, the rescuer so the rescuer may be um, had, had maybe even been attracted to a narcissistic person because they felt like that they were needed in some way or that they could rescue them um, and the thing about the rescuer they seem like they're um, the good guy in the in it all but actually all the time that you spend trying to rescue other people who usually don't want to be rescued is a big waste of all the time you could be working on yourself so oftentimes you'll see people who are in the heal healing professions or the helping professions um, playing the role of the rescuer a lot and it's um, it's not helping anyone no people usually don't like to be rescued or if you do rescue them you're um, decreasing their self-esteem because you're saying you can't help it, you can't do it yourself I and that's what we did with a whole generation of children haven't we um, I, that's what's going on in my opinion very much right now with children of like when we are so Jane is also mm -hmm. a speech therapist mm -hmm. and so she works in the in the schools with all sorts of kids with all sorts of challenges mm -hmm. as well and so keep going with so what you're so one example of where to jump on over to, to the schools that, that I've seen um, in, in my experience was um, one woman was telling me like well you know my daughter really wanted to fill out those forms for college because she wanted to know how you know she just she she said she got mad at me be, but I wanted to do it because I can do it faster but she got mad saying but I'm not gonna know how to do it mom and then I and then she was like but I got it done <laughs> so I'm like thinking to myself like you I, I felt happy at least that the child the, the student actually verbalized that and even recognized it in her mind but then that was like a perfect example of like I, I want this done you're not capable of it um, and I'm gonna do it so. so when we when we rescue kids from things all the time it kind of turns them into lifelong victims well it, it, this is these it makes people feel like that they are not going to be able to solve their own problems mm -hmm. and so this can be when um, you've got the the person on the phone talking to, to their children in their 20s who who can't make a decision without or them 30s yeah. and oftentimes it's because of the way that they were raised because they were they were they were told you know, they were told how, how, how to do everything and um, oftentimes it can be that I didn't want you to have this harsh life I'm gonna make things uh, I want you to have a different uh, lifestyle than I had but in trying to lessen whatever you think your a pain that you experienced in your childhood with your own children, you might um, go um, a little bit overboard and make the child um, not be as capable for adulthood when adulthood comes. Um, it's, it's a huge issue. Yeah, it mm -hmm. sure sounds like it. I mean, for me, I was, you know, I had a lot of, time to figure things out for myself but a, a lot of my life I was being told what to do too and that does get in the way of self-esteem you know when when you're always told what to do and how to do it and what you need to achieve and what it needs to look like you know and the school system does that to a, mm -hmm. you know us to a lot and it's hard to then you know break away from that 
and, and develop your own self-esteem that, that you can do this. So I mean, it's almost like, as they say, with all issues and societal ills, we say we're all responsible in some way. And when I was talking with you recently, you had brought up a, a good thing to say to people when um, you think that um, you have the desire to rescue them or maybe they're, they're, trying, they're fishing for you to rescue them. And I, I realized this is actually was something that I had put together on um, a list that I was giving to parents of telling them how they can speak to people empathetically. Um, and it really hit home, um, but it was when someone comes to you with a problem, you would say, you say a sympathetic, like, oh no, and then you say, what are you gonna do about it? What are you gonna it? do about it? Like, uh, when you said that to me, I was like, that's such great advice, and then later I, it clicked, I'm like, that's on the sheet that you've been handing out for years and years and years to parents. You just um, never read it. <laughs> I knew it, but it still didn't click. Um, but how often do we actually, do parents actually parent their children yes. of saying, yes. what are you gonna do about it? And instead they're like, yeah. I'm gonna solve this for you. Or like, oh, you're in a conflict with this other child, let me right. come in and be the referee. So yeah. oftentimes I've heard things about like the different culture um, somewhere in Asia where they actually let children, like young children um, in the preschool room um, settle their own uh, social problems. Mm -hmm. They don't intervene like we do um, in, in our um, culture. And yeah, because conflict and anger and frustration we don't have time for it's not allowed but in you know, the, the long run those, all those soft skills those are children had better wasters. skills better social skills in the long run they say it with the Inuit too um, I was reading about how the Inuit raised their children mm -hmm. and they used it they never yell at their children and they use storytelling instead and they kind of mm -hmm. set the kids up you know so it, if the kid isn't upset is mean to another kid They'll wait until you know the situation is over, and then uh, later on, the parent will ask the child, and they'll say something like "hit me," you know, and the kid will be like, "Am I gonna hit you?" You know, I'm, I'm not falling for that mm -hmm. one, you know. But the parent will encourage them to 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 hit them, so that the natural um, consequences, so that empathy can be developed and understanding when you do this, ow, that hurts. This you know, now I'm hurt and angry. And, and so they're able to act it out and role play conflict so that they understand the, the big picture of it and they can navigate it a lot better. We don't, we do <laughs> not do that with kids. No, and what you described just sounds like utopia. Like that sounds like amazing. That's how, you know, children learn through stories and then you're acting something out. Like mm -hmm. I, I would um, think it would be a really beautiful experience to yeah. be raised in something like that. Yeah. So uh, that's, that's the traditional way, Inuit way of raising their children. And we just, we've gone crazy here in America. So, okay. So um, flower essences, I okay. wanted to get that mm -hmm. in too, because we been about an hour okay. and I want to make sure I don't use up all my data because mm -hmm. the Wi-Fi is messed up so uh, a little bit about flower essences and then we'll wrap up okay How's that? so flower essences I came across at my most favorite place to go it's in Chicago area like three times a year it's called the body mind spirit expo and it's a $12 ticket for two days, and then there's one hour lectures that you can attend, or you can go um, and check out the booths and see all the beautiful things and products they have. So at one of the lectures that I went to, when um, I was um, definitely looking for things that were gonna help me be um, healthier mentally and physically, was a woman that was speaking about flower essences. And what flower essences are is, it's um, think of it like a plant, or a flower that's been put in uh, a, a, a bucket of water and then cooked with the heat of the sun. And then uh, that water is taken and then we're saying, oh, this is the properties of the daisy. This is the properties of, uh, of um, uh, walnut. And what we know about these different flower essences is that they can help for different um, ailments um, physically and mentally they tend to have more of a mental component but what we know is that the mind and body are connected so um, I find that in my books like they they go hand in hand um, together 
So I heard this and I thought like, well, I want to try this. Um, this sounds awesome. The person who gave this, the lecture said how much it had helped her. So I started with um, a bottle and what it, it is, is it's um, you take a number of the different um, essen uh, essences, different flower essences. Some people only um, maybe put um, a maximum of seven different essences in their bottle. But um, with my teachers, we will sometimes put more than seven if we feel that it's necessary. And so um, I had, for, for my first round, um, a, a, a bottle with a dropper and I would put 21 drops in um, a glass of water and drink my water throughout the day. And I also had a spray bottle and um, where I would spray over my head and the two remedies were slightly different but were complementary. And so when, um, I was checked in with um, after three weeks or so of being on the remedy. Then I, I had asked, you know, what do you, what seems different? And I realized um, that I was um, less um, emotional, um, and that I was um, when I would get emotional, it would be for um, it, it wouldn't be as severe. And so that was because um, I was in, in a very challenging place at that time. So then when I could reflect back and be like, oh, there has been a, a bit of an improvement. And so I just stuck with it and kept taking a couple more remedies and continued to see the improvements that, that I was looking for. And then I had an opportunity to study with the person who had made the remedies um, with, uh, with her class and become a certified flower essence provider. So then I said, well, yes, I know I wanna do this. Of course I wanna do it. And thinking, how can I use this with my speech therapy business? Um, but what I've found um, up until this point, what the, the greatest benefit has been for what I can do for myself. So I have three different um, brands of the remedies. Of I have um, Bach flower essences, which you can find um, the Bach even at uh, Whole Foods now, very affordable. The essences can be, um, I think I, when I went there the other day, it looked like it was approximately $15 in essence. Um, but I have Bach flower and essences, find horn essences and then um, Australian bush remedies. And I love Australian bush remedies um, the best, but they all are good. But um, what I've loved is um, looking in the books and actually there's uh, different remedies for codependence. So you look up codependence and you find each like little one that it could possibly be and see if any of these ring true to you. And then you take that essence and the way that flower essences work but the next time you make your next batch, you think to yourself like, well, what's going on in my life right now? What do I need? And maybe you might need to take one of those essences that you took again, and maybe the issue has been resolved, so you don't need it. You'll know when you're thinking like, well, I don't want to put too many in to dilute it. What do I really want? Um, but I found it to be um, incredibly profoundly helpful. I know um, I had the, the loss of um, a very beloved cat and it opened up a lot of grief triggers for me. Um, and I very much credit having the flower essences to be able to assist me in being able to um, grieve in a healthy way um, with the loss of um, my sweet cat. And um, also I found it to be very helpful for job interviews. Um, of going in and being able to speak with confidence. I, of course, have been drinking some flower essences tonight. Very cool. Being very sneaky to be able to help me be able to articulate as well and um, just to um, release any um, residual um, anxiousness that might be present. But um, I've had some great experiences working with my, um, my toddlers with the flower essences where um, there's, it's been almost like immediate because children's energy fields are so sensitive that when I, I would spray it over them, like I would, you even like see like a, like they're registering something. And, um, in my opinion, like that's just magical in itself to see like that some, something has, that they're noticing something. It's not just water being sprayed over their head, but I've seen, um, where the communication has come out easier after I've used the essence with them. I've, with one child, my um, best success story, he was, um, had, had uh, some pretty um, challenging behaviors that the mother was concerned about. And after being on the remedy that I had made for him, um, did, a, did a complete turnaround where it could not be just, <laughs> um, explained by anything else but the remedy, in my opinion, as well as um, the mother's. So that was my most fun one to see. But um, I love even just, uh, just 
exposing the children to it and seeing how much they love it. I Who would have ever thought that children would just like love to get sprayed over the head with a little one ounce <laughs> <laughs> like jar. I like getting sprayed over the head. Yeah, they love it. Um, but in in my opinion, these, these are very powerful. A lot of people know about um, the essential oils, how smelling that can be very helpful. Um, these these are like you know cousins, and um, there is some reading that I've done about that. People are learning about the glia brain, and that the glia brain is um, very important. Um, it w w with um, that, that we're learning about our healing and just um, of, of us being intelligent in a certain type of way. Like um, supposedly Einstein had a really big glia brain. If you can uh, believe that, I don't know. Um, I'm suspicious of all. <laughs> Um, things like that but um, it's it's just a another um, tool in the energy healing uh, toolbox and in my opinion an incredibly powerful one very gentle very um, reasonable this is not something that's complicated uh, anyone can go out to Whole Foods right now and make a remedy by themselves with a, a spray bottle what it would entail is to um, get a one ounce a bottle of water and what we do is we do um, seven drops of each essence that we put in um, our one ounce bottle. I'm actually going to show you if it's okay. okay. Perfect. Because it'll be even better with the props. I am, um, I love the why of things. And so one of the things that I did uh, a while back was uh, I, I follow research mm -hmm. about why these things work. And one of the things they talked about is they, they did a study where they took water, which was supposed to be sterile. They had something growing in the water, then they completely sterilized the water in a million different ways that it would be considered sterile and able to be used in medical situations. And they put the water into a Petri dish and, um, and what uh, it started to grow things and the anyways the the conclusion was is that everything still carries an energetic resonance to it that the water still holds and even if it's considered sterile and there's no part no anything in it it still holds the vibratory mm. wavelength of that and since we're multi-dimensional we're not um, you know, our, our, our feeling chemicals also associate to different thoughts and they associate to different um, colors and they associate to different sounds, you know. So, so when we talk about a walnut, it also has the same quality, you know, a certain quality of sound that, that the wavelength would come, you know, would come off of it in a certain color and a certain thought or feeling and that's why I believe flower essences work is because they carry the same resonance which triggers you know it's it's partners mm -hmm. pair within ourselves it triggers the the response uh, either a thought or a feeling or a nervous system response uh, because of the wavelength the energetic wavelength mm -hmm. that the that the essences carry it sounds right it's okay, your props. Okay. okay, so everyone should have one of these in their purse at all times if you're a sensitive person. Uh, this is great, but one time I was in, um, in, a, in a crisis and I was like, this isn't working. It's not doing everything that I wanted to do because I was in, a, in, in the crisis mode. So um, it, it's going to help, but sometimes if, if things are pretty Just intense, takes a little bit of you, the well, you, yeah, and you'd benefit from having other different essences, like how I do with having the essences. So mm -hmm. then I know like, oh, I need, I, I know I need this one, which is one right. that you go to when you're really um, feeling severe. So um, these are different essences that I've made for myself. I like to put I am Jane on there or their names because it's supposed to bring out the, the best qualities of your own authentic Whoa, self. Oh, neat. That's so cool. I'm experimenting with just using two um, spray bottles because I thought, oh, I want to try and avoid um, drinking alcohol because it might influence um, the leaky gut. But I do, even though I've been taught that the spraying overhead is just as um, powerful as taking it um, straight in the mouth, this is just how I spray it, or you can do your wrist too. Um, 
I, it, it's hard for me to really get away from thinking that not putting the drops in your mouth or drinking it in the water is a little bit more powerful because it's being absorbed by your mouth. So I think after doing um, a couple of these just spray bottles for this round, I'm going to go back and, and, and do the, um, the uh, dropper bottle a little bit more. There's only just a little bit of alcohol in here as a preservative is, is what um, the issue is with that. But basically, if you wanted to like go and make your own little remedy, you can um, start just right at Whole Foods and go look and see what's there. And at Whole Foods, they have different types of um, Bach flower remedies. And so um, we've got the ones that would be great to help reduce anxiousness would be um, Aspen. So we've got Aspen and that's good for, um, it says re replaces apprehension and vague fears with a sense of security and peace of mind for Aspen. And then we have Mimilus as well that is dealing with worry and fear. Um, one of these is for like unknown fears and one of them is for known fears. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, you just do a quick internet search and you'd be able to figure out which one. Rock rose is when you have like real serious tear and like you're like the, the, the stress one isn't working so well. The rock rose is a good one to go to okay. to help give some calming. And um, like for tonight, what I did was bush fuchsia to help me be able to com communicate my thoughts better, help with the left and the right hemisphere. Um, be able to commute better and a sea holly from find horn to be able to sing your own song and um, I think oh and then I, I put some dog rose in there too for um, for also reducing different fears but when you just go online you can just find out exactly there's I think there's 36 essences for for, for the Bach flower remedies and you can look and you can find out which one is speaking to me the most. And if not that one, maybe um, more of those. And, um, and combining them up to seven, it can be good to combine. And it can always be good to put your rescue remedy in a remedy that you wanna make. And so what I do is I put seven drops of each one of these that I wanna include in. I, I do put a little bit of extra brandy in there as a preservative. And then I put the remaining with some purified water and then I shake it up and then I, try to charge it with whatever type of um, materials I have that I think might be um, helping to charge it more positively. And then you've got yourself a spray where you can either, either use drops straight under the tongue, drops in your water. I like to put 21 drops of that and you're putting seven drops of each one of them in here and then you can do 21 in your drinks. I like the spray bottle concept because really we're talking about changing a vibration. Mm -hmm. You know, because that's what the flower essence is about. It's about changing a, a wavelength and a vibration. And so the wavelengths coming off of us and coming into us and the, and the wavelengths surrounding us, you know, when you spray it right above your head, you're, you're affecting those wavelengths. And I like to think when I spray my head, if I'm angry, I'm cooling myself down no. <laughs> as an as a okay. extra bonus. Because when I first started learning about it, then when I did my first round, I'm like, with the spray, is the spray really going to work? I'm like, well, it's going to make me less angry just by that saying just of by, like, you yeah. better cool down, Very simmer cool down, down, and you got That's a right. hot head, cool right. down. And it changes, it changes the vibrations around you. So um, I love flower essences. I don't ever want to not be with, with without them. Um, I feel like it just continues to support me um, in my journey and like I, I can't imagine um, not having them. They've been actually incredibly helpful when I've had um, a food poisoning and when I've had um, some feminine issues to be able to take these things and nip them in the bud and not have to take any other kind of products were um, awesome to, to see okay. how um, empowered you can be when you have um, all the um, healing right at your fingertips yeah all the different tools mm -hmm. so if you're interested in astrology if you're interested in flower essences if you're interested in codependency and narcissism uh, Jane's tagged in this video so you can uh, give her a ringy dingy and um, Jane how else can they contact you I can be reached at janemasteller at gmail.com or you can find me at, um, and contact me on Facebook. I'm Jane Masteller, M-A-S-T-E-L-L-E-R. Great, great, because she does coaching, I do coaching on all sorts of crazy issues, especially narcissism and relationships. So I think that's it for now. Thanks for coming and hanging out. Thanks for coming and hanging out with us. I hope everybody enjoyed our talk this evening. 
and uh, I'm gonna wrap it up so I can save my save my data plan okay, okay cool awesome. talk to you later guys thanks